In this series from What's Going On With Shipping, we look at what is the U.S. Merchant Marine, and in this episode, we look at Matson. Aloha! I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano, and that's right, we're going Hawaiian. No, not that. We are looking at a specific shipping line. This one is based in beautiful Hawaii, United States. This is the Matson Navigation Company, one of the oldest shipping lines in the United States, traces its history back to 1882. This is a company that is focused exclusively in the Pacific, servicing the U.S. West Coast, Hawaii, Alaska, all the way over to Asia and down into the South Pacific. Matson has one of the most unique histories of a shipping line and an impressive fleet of vessels. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. So in this series, we're looking at what makes up the U.S. March Marine, and obviously shipping lines are a major component, and Matson has to rank up there as a significant one. Now, if you look at Matson, Matson is actually made up of three different components. There is Matson Navigation Company. This is the one that does all the shipping for them. And then there's Matson Terminals. One of the key things about Matson is it operates and owns its own terminals. That allows it to have really significant express service. So during the height, for example, of the supply chain crisis, Matson ships could bypass those huge lines outside of LA and Long Beach and go directly to the berths in Long Beach for themselves. A big significance. And then there's Matson Logistics, because Matson is a whole, you know, end-to-end -end logistics company. If you've ever been in around Hawaii, you can't go anywhere without running into Matson containers. Now, Matson is also a publicly traded company, and this is the corporate profile of it with the information pulled up as of January 4th of 2024. There's a period of time when rates are going up and we're seeing really a peak here. And matter of fact, one of the things you're seeing is Matson is at really high levels. Uh, began the year pretty low, uh, 56, 51 a share. It peaked at 116.87 and sitting right now at 116.14. So a pretty high trading stock right now. Matson is actually one of the few container companies that's available on the New York Stock Exchange. Really the only other one that you can uh, invest in on the stock exchange is Zim. So the Matson fleet operates, as I mentioned, almost exclusively in and around the Pacific. So this is from Marine Traffic. I pulled up all the Matson vessels. Now, I should note that these are not all U.S. flag vessels. You'll notice down here in the South Pacific, three vessels and this one up here. These four vessels operate exclusively in the South Pacific trade, and they're fl flagged in Antigua, Barbuda. The rest of the vessels are in the U.S. service, and you'll see them operating along the west coast of the United States. There are three Matson ships that were formerly of Horizon Lines. These are the uh, D7 container ships. They operate on the west coast up to the Alaska trade, over to Hawaii, and then, of course, across to Guam and to Japan and Korea. And when you look at their services, it's an impressive service that Matson has been able to do. They operate what's called the CLX service. The CLX Plus is the China Long Beach Express service. So they go into China and then through feeder services are able to get boxes all throughout that area. The ships route up here from China in between Korea and Japan, out between the two northern islands of Japan on a great circle route up by Dutch Harbor through the Aleutians and then back down. And then you have service in and around Alaska and Hawaii. And then, as I mentioned to you before, this South Pacific service that feeds these islands, uh, Samoa, Apia, a whole batch of the small islands in and around the region, down to New Zealand and Australia, and then across the Central Pacific area too, you can see that service being done. There's also some subsidiaries that help them. So, for example, we're going to be talking about tugboats and, and tug operations in the United States in another video. But this is the site of Foss Maritime. And uh, Foss Maritime has a sister company, Young Brothers, that operate in and around the Hawaiian Islands. They provide a lot of service. So whereas you may not see a Matson ship, you may see a Young Brothers tug and barge moving those containers in and around. 
the Matson fleet is an impressive fleet when you look at it. Uh, there are some vessels on the older side, but there's also a vessel replacement program in place. Something to note is that Matson ships are not tremendously big, and that's for a very good reason. You can't get big ships into Hawaii. The Sand Island Terminal in Honolulu is limited in the size and capability of the ship. Remember, there's only about a million and a half people in Hawaii. It doesn't do you any good to bring a 20,000 box ship into Hawaii because you'd offload it and then you wouldn't need to bring another ship in for months at a time, which sounds enticing, but then goods that have certain shelf life aren't coming in. What you need are small to medium-sized containers operating on a fairly routine, regular schedule coming in, and that's not always the most profitable schedule. And one of the things that the Matson fleet is, these are mostly Jones Act built vessels, meaning that they can operate in that exclusive trade, carrying cargo from one U.S. port to another U.S. port. If you would open up the, the Jones Act and allow foreign flagships in, then Hawaii would have to be serviced by exclusive vessels of this size. You really can't be pulling in the big trans-Pacific vessels in because they're too big. You would have to dredge out Honolulu, bring in new cranes. And so a very diverse fleet, we're going to talk about some of them. These are the older D7s that are in. Uh, the Daniel K. Inoue and the Kamina Hila, those are newer ships that have been built. Uh, this vessel, Imula and Lilo 2, these are smaller vessels that operate in and around the South Pacific. Uh, you'll notice some other vessels here. So, for example, Lurleen and Matsonia. This is what's called a Conroe, a container. And then in the back here, a roll-on, roll-off vessel. You have exclusive container ships that operate in and around the areas for Matson, uh, and one of the things we're going to talk about here is the vessel replacement program that they're currently looking at. Now, the history of Matson is absolutely fascinating. Uh, I'm going to link over to the Matson webpage. It's a great about 11-minute video that goes into the history of Matson, but I want to focus on some key aspects. So Matson gets its name from Captain William Matson, who in 1882 sailed this schooner, the Emma Claudina from San Francisco to Hilo, carrying about 300 tons of food, plantation supplies, and general merchandise. And this began the relationship of Matson to Hawaii. This is a period of time when Hawaii was an independent kingdom. Later on, uh, there will be an uprising against the kingdom sponsored by the Dole family. That's right, the pineapple people. They will overthrow the Hawaiian monarchy, create the Hawaiian Republic. And then during the Spanish-American War, Hawaii will petition to become a part of the United States. Now, when I say Hawaii petitions, this is the Americans living in Hawaii petition. The native Hawaiians have a big problem with the Howleys doing this. But Matson starts to develop his connections here. And over time, the Matson fleet grows. By the time Captain Matson dies in 1917, his fleet consists of 14 different vessels. And his vessels will become instrumental during uh, World War I, for example, where many of the Matson fleet are taken over and used by the United States to actually transport troops to Germany in World War I. After World War I, there is a building program largely through the auspices of the Merchant Marine Act of 1928 that lead to the construction of four large luxury liners. These are the Mariposa, the Monterey, the Lurleen, and the Malalo as depicted here. At the same time, Matson will open up several hotels uh, working in the area. And so Matson's Waikiki hotels will provide this kind of junket from the West Coast of the United States to Hawaii. Uh, remember, you don't have air travel at this time. So these vessels are being used all the time to move passengers back and forth. When Pearl Harbor is attacked on December 7th, 1941, the four cruise liners, the Lurleen, the Matsonia, the Mariposa, and the Monterey at this time, and 33 Matson freighters find themselves right on the front lines. And matter of fact, some of those ships are targeted and sunk early in the war. The very first convoys that come into Hawaii after the attack on Pearl Harbor are Matson ships bringing relief and troops in and taking out civilians and dependents of the military. 
During the war, Matson will operate over 100 vessels. The four passenger liners will do a total of 119 voyages, covering a one and a half million ma- miles, and transport over 736,000 troops. Uh, by the time the war is over, Matson suffers a series of losses. 14 ships in the Matson fleet will be lost, a huge loss for them. But post war, they began to rebuild. They buy vessels from the U.S. government building program and once again reestablish Matson as the key supplier to Hawaii. You see a revitalization of trade, including passenger ships to Hawaii. A lot of people want to escape, head to Hawaii. So a Hawaiian cruise was always a big element. Sailing from California, the seven days it took you to get across to Hawaii. And then when air travel became the norm, we saw the dying out of those cruise vessels in and around the Hawaiian Islands. But one of the things Matson is not really acknowledged for is really the introduction of containers. We generally attribute containerization to Sealand and Malcolm McLean on the East Coast. But Matson had been experimenting with different types of containers. And in particular, they developed a 24-foot container. Sealand had a 35-foot container, but that was too big for Hawaii. And so Matson kind of developed their own unique container system. And the SS Hawaiian Merchant on August 31st of 1958 sailed out of San Francisco with 20 of those 24-foot containers on. And over time, Matson began to develop even larger ships such as this, the Hawaiian Enterprise, the really first true container ship built from the keel up a big innovation for Matson, and containerization really became the norm. This intermodal movement of goods around the islands facilitated this. You'd bring the containers from the west coast of the United States to Honolulu, the Sand Island Terminal, and then those containers, instead of having to be unpacked and unstuffed and then loaded on barges, could be just put directly on barges, and then those barges can be fed out to the other islands in the area. So Matson was a key innovator in the concept of containerization. Today, what we see with Matson is the construction of new vessels. Uh, back in 2018, 2019, we saw two Aloha class uh, container ships being built. This was being built out at the Philadelphia shipyard. These ships, 3,220 TEU, were built. And very early on, they had the capability to use liquefied natural gas, which is a key thing uh, in operation of clean propulsion. And again, you did not need a huge, massive container ship. This is the size ship that worked the best for Matson. Then later on, you built this, the Canaloa class. This is Lurleen and Matsonia. These are Conroe's container roll-on, roll-up ships, 3,500 TEUs, plus they can carry about 500 vehicles on board. They can burn conventional fuel or LNG. Very fast ships, 23 knots, really essential for moving goods back and forth between the Hawaiian Islands. And now, after the supply chain crisis, we see that Matson has placed a new order, this time with the Philadelphia shipyard once again for three new Aloha-class vessels to be built. These ships would be built with pure LNG-fueled propulsion. Uh, They will represent a high price, but because U.S. ships are expensive to build. And one of the things that has not been done, traditionally under the Jones Act specifically, is the concept of providing uh, subsidies or defraying the cost. I think if you look at Matson today, they are providing an absolute essential role. You'll hear people talk about the fact that the Jones Act doesn't have any sort of national defense features. Well, if you look at the routes Matson goes, it goes to Alaska, it goes to Hawaii, it goes to Guam, it goes out to Japan. It, it feeds U.S. bases across the Pacific. And both in World War I, World War II, Matson ships were directly in the line of fire, providing direct service for the U.S. military. It's one of the reasons why you want a domestic merchant marine. Now, there's a lot of offset against Matson. There's a lot of arguments about the fact that because you're you're buying in the United States, three container ships for a billion dollars is pricey because if you go to China or Japan or Korea, they're much less, but they're also heavily subsidized. 
over there. So maybe we need to think about what do we do to help facilitate shipbuilding in the United States? Maybe low interest loans from the US government to be paid over a set period of time. Maybe a provision should the ships not be needed in service anymore, the US will acquire the vessels to put in the reserve fleet. There's a lot of things that can be done to help offset the higher costs. But understand, living on an island in the middle of the Pacific is going to be expensive no matter what. But Matson has been one of those shipping lines that have provided absolutely exemplary service throughout its history, both in terms of commercial service and in wartime service. And I think Matson is really one of the best examples you have of a U.S. shipping line. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of big U.S. lines left that can really have the lineage that Matson has. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, give it a big thumbs up, and if you can, support the page. How do you do that? You hit that super thanks button down below or head on over to Patreon where you can become a monthly or yearly subscriber. You'll see the link pop up here in the show notes or down here below. You'll be able to go right to it. And hey, if you're with Matson, Tell me what you think. Tell me if you like it or not. I don't get a lot of feedback from Matson, even though I talk about Matson all the time. Don't get a lot of feedback from the company. Anyway, this is Sal saying aloha. <laughs>